Hello, this is Greg Creeklaw, and in this video we're going to get you started for beta testing SkyTools 3 Visual. So I'm going to go through all the setup required. Um, there's a couple things missing from this beta version. The first thing is the ability to import data from SkyTools 3, and there's a reason for that. Um, it's a very complicated process to import the data. You have to tra translate from the old databases to the new database formats. And I want to be able to change the new database formats. Um, maybe you'll make a suggestion and I'll want to add something. And if we test it all now, we'll end up having to test it all over again. So that'll be one of the last things we test. There's another good thing about that. And that is that by having to enter all the data manually, each of you will have to go through the process of doing that. And then you can uh, give me feedback and find bugs in the process of set, setting up SkyTools 3 as if it's the or 4 as if it's the first time. Um, there's also going to be a wizard in SkyTools 4 that will just take you through the setup process that I'm going to cover here and hold your hand all the way through it. If you're familiar with the starter edition of SkyTools 3, it had a, a wizard like that. But uh, that's not quite ready for prime time and I wanted to go through and test the manual setup anyhow. So this is SkyTools 4 Visual, and you'll notice there's some tabs missing. There's a, in the beta testing instructions, there's a list of things that aren't ready for prime time, and the events and the ephemerides are some of the things that aren't quite ready to test yet. Those will come along maybe in a week or so for testing. You're going to find that there's going to be a weird mix of things that are very familiar to you, because they're just like SkyTools 3, but with additional things added or they'll be changed in some way. Mostly they're going to be in a different place, right? So the, the UI has been changed. It's, it's grown to sort of fit the program. It was sort of kludgy before um, because it was forced to fit in the way it had worked in SkyTools 2. So this has been completely redesigned. It's going to take you a little while to find things. But I think for the most part, you're going to find that finding those things is much more intuitive and obvious the way it's laid out now. There are going to be a few things that just because of muscle memory or because you've been using SkyTools 3 for a very long time, there are going to be a few things that are going to be a little annoying because they're not going to be where you expect them to be. But I think overall, you're going to find that after you use SkyTools 4 for a while, you're going to absolutely hate using SkyTools 3. And um, that's a good thing. That's that's what I want. So in order to get started, we need to go up to the setup menu up here. And yes, there are top level menus now. And we're going to go down and start with the locations. Now this is one of those things that hasn't really changed. Sure, it's blue now. And it's laid out pretty much the same way. Um, you do the process the same way you did before. You click new, enter in your, your data. It shows up up here for your location everything exactly the same way in exactly the same place. Um, one addition here on the light pollution is I do have a light pollution database and it will pre-calculate the sky brightness for the location that you've entered and you can just click to use that and it'll put those values in or you can set it the way you want if you know better. I find this actually is fairly accurate. So that's one thing that's different. And the, uh, this will work for most places around the world. The other thing that's different is this set weather button. And here's the problem with the weather. The weather is, let's say I'm planning for June and it's January. Maybe I'm going to a star party and I want to get planning well ahead on that. Then what weather do I put in? And the answer is, we don't really know what the weather is going to be like, but we know it's warmer in June, maybe at the tech, maybe at, a, at whatever star party you're going to in June, than it is in, right now in the winter. So what I've come up with is this idea of a monthly average temperature. So this is the current conditions, but you'll see there's different months here for, throughout the year. So if I go to January, then this is the typical night on which I typically observe, not just any night, but a good night where I go out to observe in January. 30 degrees Fahrenheit, 30% relative humidity. 
and you can set that for each month and it will use that to plan ahead if you tell it to do that or it will use the specific temperature and humidity that you put in if you look up here on the nightly planner we'll get ahead of us ourselves just a little bit you can set the seeing and you can set the temperature and the humidity or you can click auto and if you click auto it's going to use these values here for the month that you're planning in now you'll see there's a problem here that the background color here d doesn't match and that's because I recently made a change which propagated throughout the whole program and changed some dialogues and didn't change others there are over a hundred dialogues like this in sky tools 4 it's really hard for me to keep track of them all and find them all so if you see something like this it doesn't look right like this background color here should match that color if it doesn't drop me a line send me a screen capture and I'll clean it up and this will probably be cleaned up before you see the the software in addition to the temperature and the humidity by the way this is the average seeing but it's for the whole year because seeing isn't usually that related to the time of year it's more related to what you usually see at your location and what is good enough for you to go out and observe so if if you think that you're only going to go out on nights where the seeing is pretty good then just put that and uh, so that's setting up a location really hasn't changed much just the sky brightness and the weather now let's move on to setting up um, well we can set up binoculars it's exactly the same way as it's always been we can set up observers that's exactly the same way as it's always been you can see we've got that color issue going on here um, we can set up uh, our telescope which is the main thing we want to do here today so here's our telescope dialogue and notice it's a mess there's just stuff thrown in down here on the bottom that's because I'm not quite finished with it um, this new telescope wizard is probably going to go away it doesn't do anything right now um, I'm going to replace that with the setup wizard that covers everything locations and so forth um, so that's just a leftover from an earlier idea so the main thing is is to set up your telescope and we'll start with just clicking the new button you can choose one that's listed here let's go with a 20 20 inch obsession just for fun and really all we just did was fill in these these values right here the aperture of the telescope focal length focal ratio and the 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 de optical design you can see they're all here and this is an important thing make sure you put in the optical design if you do this manually and remember to do it manually you just click enter manually there and then you'll put in these numbers so what does a built-in focal changer mean well this is something that's usually going to be unchecked but every once in a while you'll be using a system that has um, say a focal reducer built into it and so the light goes through that and that changes the amount of glass that you have in the system which is all this does is it tells us there's an extra element in the system of glass the orientation here you'll recall that in sky tool 3 you put in left right up down that sort of stuff here you just tell it what you've got so most people will put unmodified but if you have a mirror diagonal you put in mirror diagonal if you're using a correcting prism you put in the correcting prism this is intentionally left blank um, optics this is actually used to modify how faint you can see so put something in here that makes sense and the central obstruction here that's new and that has been pre-calculated based on a typical value for the type of telescope optical design of the telescope you're using for Newtonian it's estimating a 16 percent central obstruction um, obviously with a refractor it's not even there okay so back to the Newtonian if you know this value exactly go ahead and type that in so now we want to add eyepieces and we click the eyepiece add eyepiece uh, button here this is another feature that's not quite ready for prime time what we're going to be able to do is clone a set of eyepieces um, from one telescope to another 
that way you don't have to enter them all separately right now you're gonna have to enter them separately so we're gonna click add edit eyepieces this is gonna look familiar the difference is there's a lot more eyepieces here in the pool if you don't see your eyepiece you know that's not a big deal eyepieces are defined by two numbers you can um, narrow it down by make and this is a new thing the the barrel diameter now why are we keeping track of barrel diameter and that is because we're going to be able to add more than one Barlow lens and some people have Barlow's for two inch eyepieces and one and a quarter inch eyepieces and the two inch Barlow won't work with the one and a quarter inch barrel eyepiece so for sky tools to really handle all of this it needs to know which can be matched together so that's why the barrel is important I'm just going to assign some eyepieces here by clicking on them all right so we've assigned some eyepieces this one um, here the 25 millimeter I'm going to set as my finding eyepiece now what that does is it tells us that's the one we've decided usually our widest field eyepiece that we're going to use for finding things on the sky tools finder charts so it'll often automatically choose that or you'll just have a selection of finding eyepiece you can just tell it that's what you want um, so we can add multiple Barlow lenses I'm gonna click add here I'm just gonna put in a two times Barlow that works for both one and a quarter inch eyepieces and two inch eyepiece I'm just gonna click I'm just gonna leave that empty and you can see it filled in a two times dual um, Barlow let's add a three times I can put in a name if I wanted it's just going to automatically just put the three over there so I've added two Barlow lenses if this telescope has a coma corrector then we could put in the magnification of factor for, for that coma corrector um, if not you just leave this blank that will work in conjunction with the Barlow's that we have selected and um, there we go so those are our eyepieces just a couple new additional things we want to make sure and select the mount for our telescope this is going to be a daub and because it's a daub we can put in the Dobson's hole radius and it'll use this in in planning so I'm gonna say that I don't want to get within 10 degrees of the zenith because at that point it's too hard to point the telescope it's just spinning around and whatever value you're comfortable in with you put this in here what this is going to do is going to create a hole overhead 20 degrees across that um, it will try to avoid in planning so the next thing to do is to set up our finder scopes and this is going to be used primarily on the finder charts um, you, over the years I've called the, the finder chart simulation charts and I'm just going to call them all finder charts now there's it's going to be the overhead sky chart the naked eye chart and the finder chart so the finder chart is going to be created custom created for this particular telescope once I finish it and it will include um, all of the finders so I'm going to just say I've got a laser finder right so we've set up a um, non magnifying finder device that's what goes in here or I could say I've got a Rigel quick finder with a bullseye automatically sets that up or I could go with um, a manual setup in which case I can put in the value for the rings if I want or crosshairs or, or whatever I want to do we're just just gonna go with the Rigel quick finder for magnifying finders we can have up to two finders now so you have to set up finder one first I'm gonna go with an 8x52 with a diagonal now what I could have done is I could have chosen to define manually and put in the numbers 8 by 52 mirror diagonal and this is the field of view and the field of view is actually the hard thing to find for finders they're not it's, it's not always very accurately described and sometimes it's not part of the specifications for a finder at all so sometimes you have to go out and measure this and if you have to do that then define it manually once we have one finder selected we can set up the second magnifying finder if we have one it works exactly the same way so there is 
the process of setting up a telescope. I'm going to click done. Now, this is our old um, defaults dialog. This is the same idea here. I've got lots of words on here to describe what this is because uh, people initially found it very confusing. So it's going to build a chart now customized for this specific telescope, the one I just added. So what do we want that chart to look like? How do we want it to be set up? If we've got a similar telescope already set up, we can click down here and say, I want it to look just like this telescope. And it will inherit all of the settings from that telescope. But we're just going to use the standard defaults and close it. And it's recalculating the Messier list. Uh, what are the things do we have to set up? Um, preferences. There'll probably be some more preferences here. There's some missing. They'll probably come back. Um, depends on a lot of things. But just general, what format do you want the time in? AM, PM, 24 hours. Uh, when you start the... The, the software, does the nightly planner stay with the date you were working with or does it always adopt today's date? And that's a personal preference. I often work in the ahead in the future, so I usually want it to keep the date I was working with. How you want the coordinates displayed and the uh, night vision brightness, which is best um, changed when you've uh, got the night vision going. And then this button here is the good old reset the defaults button. And that will reset all your selections, like the ones across the top here. And I'll probably be telling you to reset the defaults from time to time in order to um, solve problems you might be running into or, or as the first step in solving those problems. And you just go ahead and, and reselect your selections. It uh, doesn't get rid of any of your actual data. You're not going to lose your telescope, but you're just going to use which tel lose which telescope is selected at the top. Then, of course, the, the designation thing um, works exactly the same way as it used to. You can select Messier, move that to the top or whatever, and that will affect how designations are used throughout the software, uh, except on charts, which has its own. So that is all the basic setup. Oh, one more, manage subscriptions. This is new. Um, this tells you what thing, or tells the software which things to download. So if you never observe comets, you can just turn them off. Um, if uh, you're, you never observe bright minor planets, you can just turn those off. Every time you start Sky Tools 4, it will go out, check, see if there's new versions of this data, and download it. So there's no more any update current list. These are your current lists, and you can turn them on or off um, depending. Um, since they're really only updated once a, once a month, it's, it'll just go out, check, say it's not there, and move on. You have the option of updating now if you want. So that's, this basically is the same thing as update current list in SkyTools 3. The only difference is if you have all these turned on, it'll already have done it when you started the software. So it'll always be current every time you start it, assuming you're connected to the Internet. So those are all of the setups. In the next video, I'm going to go over uh, the nightly planner and the changes that have made there. And then in the third video, we're going to go over the real-time observing, which is one of the major things that we're testing because it's got some new features and they need to be explained. And one of those new features actually snuck back here into the nightly planner. So I'm going to show you that as well. I think it's really cool. I hope you like it. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.